reflecting on the particular advantages related to the Dharma. This meditation is composed of two parts, five individual advantages and five circumstantial advantages. The five individual advantages, the advantage of support, the advantage of place, the advantage of possessing a complete sense faculties, the advantage of intention, and the advantage of faith. The advantage of support. Support refers to the human life. Without obtaining a human life, one cannot encounter the Dharma. Now that we have obtained a precious human life and possess the favourable conditions for practising the Dharma, we have the advantage of support. The advantage of place. If you are born in a remote place where the Dharma is not available, you will never have the opportunity to encounter the teachings and realisations of the Buddha and you won't be able to discern right from wrong. Now that we were born in a central land where the Dharma is flourishing, we have the advantage of place. Central land means the place where the Dharma is available. In terms of geography, central land refers to the Vajra seat in India, the sacred place where 1,000 Buddhas of the Good Kalpa attained enlightenment. In terms of the Dharma, Central land refers to a place where the teachings and realizations of the Dharma are present, especially where there is transmission, learning, meditation and practice of the Buddha's teachings to continue the lineage of the Buddha's wisdom. A place without teaching, learning, meditation and practice of the Dharma to continue the Buddha's wisdom is not considered a central land. Only the places where the teachings and realizations of the Dharma thrive are central lands of the Dharma. The other places are border regions. We are now at the junction of the central and border regions. Outside our Dharma center is the border region, while inside our Dharma center is the central region. The advantage of possessing a complete sense faculties. Having deficient sense faculties would be an obstacle to practicing the Dharma. If you are free of such disabilities, you have the advantage of possessing complete sense faculties. To study the Buddha's teachings, one must have complete sense faculties. Sense faculties don't include the mental faculty, but mainly refer to the five physical sense faculties, eye, ear, nose, tongue and body. If any of these five faculties are deficient, one cannot become a monastic that observes the precepts. Strictly speaking, those with deficient sense faculties cannot become monastics. Buddha Shakyamuni stipulated that to ordain as a monastic, one must have all sense faculties intact. Otherwise, one would not be qualified to join the monastic community. On one hand, this rule is intended to prevent mockery from non-Buddhists, which could undermine others' faith in Buddhism. On the other hand, individuals with deficient sense faculties could not fully receive the Buddha's teachings. Therefore, not accepting those with disabilities into the monastic order is not because the Buddha lacks compassion. People with disabilities can learn the Buddha's teachings as lay practitioners. However, the Buddha made such rules for the Sangha to prevent mockery from non-Buddhists. If someone were to mock a monastic, it would be detrimental to both the person and the Sangha. 
That is why people with disabilities are not allowed to join the monastic order, similar to not allowing them to serve in the military. The Buddha's insight is vast and far-reaching. Having incomplete sense faculties can obstruct Dharma practice. If the eye faculty is deficient, one cannot see the Guru, Buddha images, scriptures, etc. If the ear faculty is deficient, one cannot hear the Guru's teachings and peace instructions. As a result, one cannot engage in the hearing stage of Dharma practice. Additionally, they cannot hear Buddhist hymns. Having deficient ear faculty is quite unfortunate. If the body faculty is deficient, one cannot receive the teachings. For example, individuals who are bedridden or paralysed with numb limbs have no response to various stimuli and their brains may have stopped working. They can only maintain their heartbeat and breathing. If the nose or tongue faculties are deficient, there are some obstacles, but not significant ones. The advantage of intention. If one's livelihood is wrong, one will engage in negative actions and deviate from the Dharma. The advantage of intention means being joyful towards the Dharma. A wrong livelihood refers to making a living through killing, warfare, etc. Among the ten advantages, being free from wrong livelihoods is an important one. Wrong livelihoods primarily refer to being born as a hunter, prostitute or butcher. They have to engage in these occupations from a young age. In ancient India, the caste system was very strict and one's caste was determined by birth. The descendants of the royal caste and merchant caste would enjoy privileged treatment. Those of lower castes, such as butchers and prostitutes, however, would have to do inferior work generation after generation. Even in today's India, the situation is still the same. The daughters of prostitutes can only be prostitutes. Their karmic force makes it difficult for them to move in a positive direction. This is called having a wrong livelihood. It can be further explained as follows. As Petro and Poche said, any actions of body, speech and mind that go against the Dharma are considered wrong livelihoods. Very few of you are free from wrong livelihoods. Most of us have a wrong lifestyle. Why? Because as long as our body, speech and mind are not in line with the Dharma, we have a wrong lifestyle. It is difficult to be free from wrong lifestyles. Many gurus use the term wrong livelihood to refer to those who used to be monastics in the past, but later disrobed and engaged in various unwholesome actions, or those who were devout lay practitioners, but later turned to non-Buddhist paths and abandoned all Dharma practices. However, strictly speaking, as long as your body, speech and mind are not in line with the Dharma and your mind is deluded, your lifestyle is wrong. For example, if your mind is controlled by jealousy, anger or greed, you have a wrong lifestyle. If you speak ill of others out of jealousy or anger, this also falls under wrong lifestyles. Furthermore, if your actions violate the precepts you observe, such as the five precepts, the eight-branched one-day vow, and the Bodhisattva vows that lay practitioners can observe, strictly speaking, 
this is also considered a wrong lifestyle. As long as your body, speech and mind don't conform to the Dharma, you have a wrong lifestyle. If everything we do, such as spiritual practice, recitation of sutras, circumambulation and pilgrimage to sacred mountains is solely for the sake of getting benefits in this lifetime, even if we are called virtuous or wise, we have a wrong lifestyle. This is because seeking well-being in this lifetime is a wrong lifestyle. No matter what you pursue, even if you seek spiritual accomplishments in this lifetime, it is still a wrong lifestyle. Buddhas and Buddhasattvas help sentient beings based on their circumstances, life after life. Why do you insist on seeking accomplishments in this very life? Today, someone told me, I want to become an abbot. He hasn't even become a monk, but wants to become an abbot. This is a wrong mindset. Why do you want to become an abbot? You are daydreaming and will run into problems. Your motivation is problematic. You should first think, I aspire to help sentient beings and benefit them. To benefit them better, I must cultivate myself. Or, to benefit sentient beings, I must eliminate self-grasping, anger and other afflictions. Just focus on benefiting sentient beings. No spiritual master desires to become an abbot. In ancient times, Even if someone invited a spiritual master to become an abbot, they would refuse. They were often pushed into the position. If sentient beings really need you, you can take the role without hesitation. But you have to reach the corresponding spiritual level. If you still have a desire for fame and leadership, you'd better not become an abbot. Otherwise, you are creating the causes for samsara. Don't think that becoming an abbot will free you from the cycle of reincarnation. You will still fall and continue to be stuck in samsara. As long as you still have attachment to the eight worldly concerns, you'd better not crave this position. Otherwise, if you become an abbot, your samsaric habits will trigger slanderous thoughts in others. Because you lack virtue, your worldly habits will often show up. As an abbot, you will be mocked by others. Even if you look like an abbot in appearance, you should know whether you have truly reached that level. In our daily practice, we should pay attention to the following. If you don't want to become a person with a wrong lifestyle, you should often pray to the Guru and the Three Jewels. Even when you only offer a lamp, light a stick of incense, or bow once, you should pray to the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas to constantly bless you to practice virtuous deeds and benefit sentient beings life after life and never be reborn as a person with a wrong lifestyle. To avoid falling into a wrong lifestyle, we should not stay away from the community of practitioners. If you are already close to liberation, that is another story. As a beginner, if you leave the community of practitioners, you will undoubtedly fall into a wrong lifestyle. Once you leave the spiritual community and return to the secular world, the strong karmic forces of worldly people will immediately lead you astray. A lay practitioner told me, when I study the Buddha's teachings, compassion arises in me. When I am with fellow practitioners, I also feel a sense of harmony and compassion. However, when I interact with worldly people, 
my heart immediately becomes cold and fights with them. This is because worldly people have intense anger and greed. When you interact with them, for example in a social or business setting, you are immediately influenced by their karma. Somehow you become like them, speaking harshly and losing your gentle heart. The Advantage of Faith If you have no faith in the Dharma, you won't turn your mind to it. Now, we can turn our minds to the Dharma, so we have the advantage of faith. In summary, the five advantages mentioned above, being born in the central land, possessing complete sense faculties, obtaining a human life, not having a wrong livelihood, and entering the Dharma with faith are conditions that each individual should possess. Hence, they are called the five individual advantages. Please reflect on yourself. If you possess these five conditions, you have the fortune to study the Dharma. If any of these conditions is missing, you can hardly sit here and listen to the Dharma. For example, without faith you won't enter the Buddhist path. If you were born in a border place, you won't have the chance to study the Dharma. If any of these five advantages is absent, you won't be able to sit here and listen to the Dharma. Therefore, it is not easy to have the opportunity to study the Dharma. You can contemplate how difficult it is to obtain a precious human life with all the favourable conditions. Nowadays, we are in the age of Dharma decline, where very few people have the freedom to practice the Dharma. Even if they have faith, they may not have time to listen to the teachings. Or even if they have faith and dharma, they may not have much time to practice it. After practicing for a while, they may return to the secular world and create samsaric karma. After creating karma, they will... They repeat the cycle over and over again. As a result, even when they are full of energy, they won't devote their time to dharma practice. This is tricky. It depends on your merit. That's why we will learn the accumulation of merit later on. First, we should accumulate merit by practicing the human and heavenly vehicle so that we will have time and money. Thus, we don't need to be busy with livelihood concerns. Alternatively, if you can dedicate at least half of your time to Dharma practice and use the other half to make a living, you are already considered fortunate. Question from a disciple. How can we accumulate merit quickly? Answer. The main way to quickly accumulate merit is to practice the ten virtuous actions. If you do virtuous deeds with Buddha Chitta, you will accumulate merit swiftly. Later, we will learn that the fastest way to accumulate merit is through mandala offering. By doing so, you will quickly have free time. Although you may not be wealthy, you can at least meet your basic needs. With this foundation, you will have plenty of time to practice the Dharma. In this case, you are considered to have freedom in Dharma terms. <laughs>